I'm Alan Fletcher. I'm president and CEO of the Aspen Music Festival and School. I'm a composer. And Sorry. No. Nope. Great. And we, we are here to um, talk about what to listen for in music. And we're borrowing this title from a book by Aaron Copeland. You do not have to have read the book. If you have read the book and want to ask uh, questions based upon it, that is very good. I think we'll probably do more of that in the second session. Uh, but by all means, uh, feel free. Um, and um, I was asked yesterday at the concert whether uh, I would be explaining what makes the last movement of Mahler 6 so great. I will not be answering that question. <laughs> um, maybe by the third session uh, we'll get there. What I hope to do is develop uh, some vocabulary for talking about music. And in particular, the question, when you hear a performance and someone says, oh, that was so musical, what is meant by that statement? Because presumably, every single performance of music you hear is musical. So what is meant by uh, the praise of a performance when someone says it is so musical? And I have some beginning thoughts about that, but that's what we're going to look at today. Today, especially in terms of phrasing. And I did a thought experiment for myself this week. I went to all of our master classes. We have so many in the course of a week, but I spent some time in each one uh, this week, especially our opera scenes class, and um, found that something like 90% of the comments made were about phrasing. And in particular, over and over again, the master class givers were, were saying, please show us the structure by your phrasing. Please show us the harmony by your phrasing. Please show us the direction of the phrase by your phrasing. Please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was not in the master class. Um, so um, I thought I would start with a demonstration. This comes from a, a wonderful conductor and speaker, Ben Zander, uh, who's a friend of mine from Boston. And um, parts of this will be painful. But we're going to look at, oh, here it is. Also, if I may say, I'm going to do some playing during this. And I want to tell you something about my piano performance. Um, I, I, I had a double major in piano and composition at Juilliard, uh, which sounds great. But my piano teacher in my first lesson, um, I had auditioned uh, with two works of Schoenberg and some Bach and Brahms. And he took me into his studio. I went into his studio at Juilliard. He had the self-portrait of Arnold Schoenberg on the wall. He had known Schoenberg extremely well himself. And so when he opened with you play like a composer, I thought, wow, that's like the best compliment I ever got. And I was even embarrassed. And I said, Mr. Latiner, I'm so thankful and grateful to you for saying that. He said, no, what I mean is you think a few ideas make up for the complete absence of technique. <laughs> so anyway, so keep, keep that in mind. Um, so I'm going to play this Mozart sonata. Now, uh, that was musical because I played every single note, except the last one, correctly. I played all of the rhythms correctly. Uh, I didn't do one thing. The editor has marked this dolce. I didn't do that part. But I played every single note with exactly the same emphasis. So I hope you agree that was horrible to listen to. And now I'm going to go one step into an interpretation. got the last note right that time. Um, now I played every other note with the same emphasis, but in between I put a little space. Okay. Now here is a slightly better. So now um, these measures are 4-4, four, four, and now I split each measure in half and, and kept it an emphasis in, in the half of each measure. Is this good so far? OK, you're with me. Now we're going to go for the whole measure. Okay. 
better. Uh, that's four measures worth, and each measure had an emphasis on the downbeat. Um, now I'm just arbitrarily going to go for two measures at a time. Probably you still agree better. I'm going to try for all four measures at once now. Bear in mind, I'm not a pianist. Now, you may feel as though now it's not that interesting. It's just all level. So now I'm going to make a choice about this. And this is the choice I made. I think it, it starts by showing you what key it's in. This is C major. And all of those notes are the tonic chord of C major. Then it's going to go to uh, a version of five. And then back to C major. Then it's going to go to four. This is a particular version of four. It doesn't matter what it is, but it is particular. Uh, and then back to one. And then five. And those are the basic building blocks of common practice tonal harmony. One, four, five. Um, so what I wanted to do was not emphasize one, because one is sort of a given. I just wanted you to hear that move. And then I wanted you to hear this move. And then after that, it's sort of all done. I'm going to play it again. And I've done this in a couple of ways. I've done it with tone color to the extent of my ability. I could have been better. Um, and I've done it with time. I just took the tiniest extra time to show you the and this. Um, and that was it. So um, the beginning student doesn't necessarily know that that's the harmony, but the uh, the good musician does know and has the intention of showing you that. You don't have to know that's the harmony. Uh, I would not propose that any listener think, oh, that's a German augmented sixth chord. How beautiful. Um, but if the performer knows the German augmented sixth chord is the most special moment in the whole phrase and, and makes it that way, then the performer aligns herself or himself with the music with the intention of the composer, as shown on the page. Um, another thing you hear very often in great master classes, I heard it a lot this summer already, is start from the text. Start, from, start with respect to the text. Uh, there's a wonderful thing you can still see on YouTube, uh, the great Stella Adler, teacher of acting. And she had a class, and they were doing, I don't know, the climactic scene of um, Death of a Salesman whatever they were doing. And she stops them and she says, you are not respecting the text. And the actors are going, no, we're, we're doing a great job. We're full of emotion. Um, and she says, no, the ideal is to be like a musician. Musicians respect the text. When I watched that, I, I watched it when it was actually first broadcast, and I thought, well, if only. Um, but, but, um, but it was a nice thought. OK, so you're with me on how that interpretation worked. It's all about looking at a phrase and not thinking it's just a set of pitches and rhythms, but thinking the pitches and rhythms on the page are showing us a structure which is deeper and which is longer. And our job as the performer is to reveal that structure. Okay. So now we're going to go to a slightly harder one and also harder for me to play, I might add. Bear with me. Uh, this is Schubert's uh, great uh, B-flat sonata, uh, Deutsch Catalog uh, 960. Anyway, uh, written in the very last year of his life. Um, 
it is one of the greatest pieces of music, so please forgive me for what I will do with it. Um, I'm going to start playing the opening phrase, uh, which curiously is nine bars, but I'm going to start playing it um, in a fairly neutral fashion, I hope. And when I say nine bars, uh, I just want to say an aside, is that um, most classical music is phrased in four, eight, 16, 32 bars. Um, it's a very special thing. Um, for instance, the uh, Brahms variations on a theme of Haydn are five bar phrase. Next time you hear them, think about what is the extra bar. We're not doing that today. Um, here I will wager most of you will as soon as you hear this phrase, we'll know what the extra bar is. There will be no quiz. the extra bar? No? Not taking a risk? You might be terribly wrong. If you say something, you might be horribly wrong. Yes? Two notes. Yeah. Da, da, I can't do it. Uh-huh. OK, I'm interested. So I, I, I want to stick on this point then. It's the fifth. The fifth bar? I think so. That's very fancy. Um, what I'm doing, by the way, is uh, there are nine measures here. I'm playing each one as similar to the other as I can. So it's just very even. You're hearing the music. Um, really? I'm going to do it again. Now, now I'm worried about all you. <laughs> One of these things is not like the others. <laughs> okay, it's the, the phrase proceeds in a, in a truly normal classical way until the end, and then there's this weird trill thing that happens. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I was playing it evenly. Um, now um, I think I'm gonna go for two bars at a time. thing is like from outer space. Um, not that you need to worry about this, but that is not in the key. The key is B flat, and that's a G flat trill. G flat is not in the key of B flat. So it literally is from some other universe happening. OK, we're going to come back to the G flat in a minute. But uh, this interpretation I just did gave us a nice moment, which is this. That's the highest note in the phrase. I think it was very beautiful what I did. Um, however, uh, in a minute we're going to hear four or five great pianists playing the same phrase, and so you're going to have to remember how much better they are than what I did. Um, let me try this. I, um, the first part of the phrase goes... So I'm going to try to emphasize that. Nice. Okay, thank you. You can compliment me. Um, however, I have to tell you, it's marked in my score. Um, don't do that. It was marked by my teacher at the time. Because I came into my first lesson with this piece, and I thought that was a beautiful idea. And my teacher said, that is so gross. <laughs> don't, don't do that. And that turned out to be a great lesson. Uh, by the way, I just want to, because this uh, wonderful teacher is now deceased, I want to pay tribute to him. Robert Helps, fantastic pianist and composer. And he subscribed to a very uh, unusual 
not to say freakish, theory about how to learn pieces, which is if he had assigned me this piece, he said, don't practice it, don't like play it, but learn the piece by looking at it, don't listen to a recording, and decide in each phrase one thing that you want to emphasize. Then just play that thing. Um, and fill in, in real time, think through the piece, only playing. Um, except it would have been in real time, so it would have been very slow and sort of agonizing. But he said, until you have that in your mind, spinning the whole thing through, then begin adding the other notes. So that all the detail is subordinated at every moment that you ever think about the piece to the main idea. Then he said, so your idea is that these are the downbeats. And he would say, that's a very stupid approach to the piece. So we'd say, we start by showing the key, B flat, this is still B-flat. So he said, so nothing has happened, so don't do anything. Um, this gets a little fancy, but um, this is the piece. And he said, is the first one important? No. The third one is important. That's where the movement is. So now we have this. We're going to skip this. The first time we hear this, there's going to be no emphasis until the third one. And not to be too um, particular about it, but <clears throat> Schubert shows this in the score. I'm not going to tell you how at this moment, but he absolutely shows you that the third one. Yes? The composer compose with the major parts first and then fill in? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Every composer has a different method, but every composer I know, and that's a lot of composers, starts by thinking, what is the important thing in this whole piece? What is the one moment I'm really aiming at? And it might be at the beginning, it might be at the so-called golden section, it might be at the end, whatever it is, that you're aiming at a moment. And then everything else is subordinate to that. Yes? Yes, that's a very good point, and we're going to hear that when I play you real pianists playing this phrase. Because you'll see, they do very different things. Generally, it's not that there's a single right thing, it's that the player chooses, and you choose what is going to be your one thing in the phrase, and then the, everything else falls into place. And then that one thing suggests some other things that happen later in the piece. So in a really great interpretation, everything is working together. And uh, thank you, that's, that's a great comment. But um, let me continue with this. Okay, so I want this, I don't want this. I don't want the first of these, I want the third one. So that it rounds onto the return to the tonic. And then I really want this. This, this is the special moment in the phrase. Um, then I don't want anything to happen until... Because that is clearly the real snake in the grass, if you will. Um, that's what's really happening in this phrase. Um, okay, let me try it.
Okay, not so bad. Um, I want to point out, and again, if this is like too much, don't worry about it, but uh, it is interesting that this phrase, therefore, has exactly and only the same elements as the Mozart phrase I played. Starts with the tonic, moves five and back to one quickly, then goes four, and you know, for the theory buffs, four, six, four, very special thing, back to the tonic, and then the phrase is done. So, um, I'm going to play this again, just in case you want to hear that. In this simple Mozart phrase, I'm going to go for the four. It's halfway through the phrase. Just took a slight extra time before it, so that, you, so that you would hear that. And in this phrase, it's in a different key, so it's a little tricky to hear. All this stuff is like normal. Until here. And that's the thing for the, for the phrase. Um, Again, I'm just going to throw this in for theory buffs and people watching at home. Um, if you want to look at this extremely long movement, um, the, the major keys in this piece, the major keys in, in, in most pieces are one, four, five, and one. And if you want, you know, two, you can have it. But no one really cares about two. And Six is pretty, but it goes away fast. Five, one. Um, however, Schubert is at the beginning of the Romantic era, and he's after something very different. And what he's after, this is B flat, four, five, one. And what Schubert wants is this. It's a chord not in the key. It's based on G flat. That's the funny trill. And he's so interested in that key that the key sequence of this movement is going to be a B flat, G flat, then it's going to get stranger, F sharp minor, which is also based on G flat, then all of a sudden, yay, F, which is five and one, and then C sharp minor, and then D flat major, and then five one. Yes? Um, to what extent should a listener be aware of the different keys? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you absolutely should not be thinking, oh, G flat. Um, even if you have perfect pitch, I would not recommend that way of listening. Um, however, you might think, that is a very strange move, and you might hear the strange move. Um, let's see if you've got it in, in this Schubert. What I want to say, again, this is, this is a little more advanced, and it's just if you want to think about it, you can or not think about it. Um, this is the key sequence uh, in this piece. I don't know whether to put the chess mark there. <laughs> like, those are very strange choices. This is a normal choice. C sharp, then it does all kinds of crazy stuff. Ends up actually. Um, with some D flat, crazy stuff. Um, then we get to D, which is more normal. Um, and from there, back to B flat. Now, for the, for the theory buffs, what we have here is these key areas spell the tonic chord. So that's normal. And these key areas, with this, spell a G flat major chord. So the, the two big things in this piece are those, which is very unusual. 
Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven would never in a million years have done this. Um, so going to your question about what are you supposed to hear, because you're not listening to the piece thinking about the harmony, but you may think about what's expected or unexpected. So for instance, the trill should sound a little strange to you. You should think, what is going to happen to us now? So I'm going to actually attempt to play the first 30 bars-ish. Serpent is in the garden now, but there's a long pause. Uh, Mark Andre Hamlam played this piece uh, two weeks ago, and he went a really long pause. I thought, well, that's that's gutsy. Anyway, I talked into the pause. Here we go again. Piece seems to just start again. the trill again, but now it's on B-flat. Then this happens. Um, it's the same theme, but now it's in the remote key of G-flat. And what I think you should get is that he's just sort of fallen off something. It's in a completely strange territory. And from here, this very long movement, every, almost everything that happens is unexpected. And it should have a sense of surprise to you. Um, I want to say one funny thing about this, though. It's a very long piece. It takes an hour to play. And it has all these repeat marks. And my piano teacher, uh, who told me not to do the gross things, um, also said he was a very sweet and gentle man. But I said, should I take the repeat? And he said, when I go to juries, I take a gun. Because if I hear the repeat happening, I have to shoot someone. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he said, don't take the repeat. However, I think he was wrong. Marc Andre played the repeat. I was very happy to hear it. Um, we may actually, in the second of these classes, get to why repeat or why not repeat. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, OK, are you with me that the piece went a strange place? That's the only important thing. Judith. Well, I also, oh. what, what is the composer trying to do? Because I think it's not just for the sake of the But it is, it, it's for a sense of dislocation. This is the essence of the romantic period. Is, is things are not going according to plan. But is that a reflection of the society? The mm -hmm. culture? Is that what the... I, th I think that's the essential romantic idea, is, is an effect, a surprise, a frisson, uh, you know, something different. And, um, you know, Mozart is after something very different. He wants order, balance, clarity, transparency, he wants you to go, yes, that is exactly right. He doesn't want you to be worried. Um, but, but in the Romantic era, people, people wanted us to be worried. And they achieved it. Um, but as I, I showed over here, uh, part of how that is happening is a completely different idea of the large-scale structure of the piece from what uh, Haydn or Mozart would ever have done. You know, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of stuff that we'll come back to, I hope, uh, because this seems like an interesting point. Uh, in a minute, we're going to hear a lot of Beethoven sonatas. Um, but Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, of course, Bach, Handel, everyone uh, in that category, starts a piece by showing you what key it's in. That's a pretty important thing. So this is a Haydn symphony. We 
don't want any uncertainty <laughs> about what's happening to us. Here is a Chopin mazurka written only one generation or two later. This is the beginning of the piece. Let me play it better. I, I tortured generations of theory students by just playing that much and saying, what key is it in? And there actually is no correct answer yet. Uh, a whole chunk of the piece has happened, and it's very indeterminate what key it's in. And some people would say it's in F. I would say that's possible. And some people would say it's in A, and I'd say that's possible too. And um, He's not showing you. And let me point out, listen to me play that again, and, and I hope you agree that I'm trying, because the key is undetermined so far, I'm also trying to make the surface of the music as indeterminate as I can make, make it. phrasing, sometimes I'm putting two bars together, sometimes I'm putting one bar together, sometimes I'm putting four together, sometimes I'm emphasizing the second of three beats. This piece starts with a rest, which is a purely conceptual device. How can a piece start from a rest? But it does. And so the first sound you hear is not the beginning of the piece. It's crazy. Um, a performer has to do some trick to themselves, to think. Uh, very often, you, I, I've seen this piece played live many times, very often you see the performer breathing the rest before beginning the piece. But when John Cage wrote his famous piece, Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, where the whole piece is silence, this is the beginning of that. Because <laughs> the, the, the piece starts with a rhetorical device that the audience can't possibly hear, a rest. Okay. Um, now let's do another quiz for you. Because I'm going to play well into the piece, um, and you're going to decide when, does it, when is the first what would be called downbeat? When does the piece finally arrive someplace? One downbeat in all of that music. I hope you got it. Yes, you feel like you got it. You're nodding at me. That's good. Um, and yet, uh, now this is more technical, but uh, the, the first thing when I do this for music theory classes, the first place they usually want is there, is that one. But the actual sound you're hearing there is this. It's a, a really strong dissonance. That's not a chord, that's not a harmony, that's not a tonality, that's... If I did this long enough, you would have got really annoyed. <laughs> that is not an arrival point. I can do this for a while. Um, there's a fantastic John Cage story. Um, 
I had the honor of presenting a festival of his, of his music where he was present and uh, it was the last public appearance he made. Um, but he would do that. And he'd say, I'm going to do this until you're screaming. <laughs> and uh, he would do it for a long time. And then people would say, okay, we're screaming now. And he would say, and I was just starting to like it. <laughs> anyway, um, interesting thing about this, this is the technical part you don't have to grasp if you don't want to, is that that's the first sound in the piece too, which is completely indeterminate as to key. And it's the first sound here of the melody, and then it's the first sort of downbeat. And later in the piece, you have to go home and hear the piece to hear this. We're going to get this, which is the same sound. Um, and the piece is going to end like this. Not in the key that the piece really is in. It begins and ends in a different key from the real key. So this is, as I say, just 50 years later, but the whole Romantic era is aiming at this indeterminacy. Yes? How does the, comp does the composer hear these keys? I mean, in other words, I guess my question is, how do they determine the key structure? Um, is it in their head um, to begin with? Mm -hmm. So whether you, whatever key mm -hmm. you begin with and you modulate into is all something that's being heard in the composer's head. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, most composers I know, I know composers who have perfect pitch and those who don't, but even the ones who don't almost always hear the piece in a particular key. And a key has a sort of color to it, it, uh, it has a meaning to it, and then part of that is all the music you've heard. Because by now, D minor has a very special meaning based on the great pieces by Mozart and Beethoven and Brahms that are in D minor. So you can't hear D minor without hearing all of those pieces you know. Uh, e flat is a very special key. C minor is a very special key. Um, okay, so uh, this is not where I thought I would go, but now I'm just gonna show you. So, um, yeah, oh, yes. Hi. Yes, I, you have used the word dissonance, and I wonder if does that apply now to these notes are at that are not a harmony, and is dissonance an arrival point to add mystery or melancholy? Yeah, I think um, even in the most uh, strictly tonal periods, dissonance is the important thing. Um, uh, but in the Romantic era, it becomes everything. Um, so that um, here's the beginning of about five hours of music. Curiously, in exactly the same key as the Chopin I just played. But this, this happens about 35 years later. This is the beginning of Tristan. Um, it is completely not in a key. I mean, it's, it's already, in, in the course of one part of a phrase, it's already moved among about three different keys without being determined by any. Interestingly, the opening interval is exactly the same as the Chopin piece. There's the big dissonance. Which seems to be pointing towards a different key. Um, uh, what happens next? Yeah, well I didn't prepare this, so I'm not gonna play Tristan from memory. But anyway, um, the, the opening of the prelude goes three phrases each in three different keys. So the listener is just going, what is going to happen to us? And uh, 
And that's the point.